started looking at Mary, the mother of Jesus, and and really, there's a lot there. It when you think about it, and I noticed this as I was going through this study. When you look at some of these women in the Bible, there's not a lot about them. And, and there's really not a lot about Mary unless you kind of read between the lines. Um, but even though there's not much written, I think there's a lot that can be learned. And so last week as we looked at Mary, uh, we, saw that, uh, we saw that God sees your faithfulness. You know, you think about, about Mary's life and how God came to her and God chose her because of who she was. God chose her because of her heart. And so even when we don't necessarily get uh, recognition for things that we do and, and, uh, and even our co- accomplishments, you know, don't wear the robe at graduation and you don't go through the, you know, all of the ceremonial stuff, you know, God still sees everything that we do. God is, God is watching and, and God will reward when it is necessary. And so then we also saw that God can do the impossible because we know Mary was a virgin. She said, how can this be, Lord, since... I know not a man, and, and just the, the amazing, miraculous birth of, of our Savior. And God did that. And because we know that God can do the impossible, there's nothing in our lives that is too big for God. And God can handle anything that comes our way. And then we also saw that uh, God's way is, it doesn't always make sense. Sometimes when we, when we seek the will of God and then God gives us His will, we're scratching our heads thinking, Lord, that, that can't be right. You know, as you look at the life of Mary and, and uh, the life of Joseph and Joseph wanting to put her away and, and not wanting to make her a public spectacle because he loved her, but he had to be comforted and he had to be, you know, the angel had to come to him and say, no, this is, this is God's will and, and you need to just trust. And, and Mary had to do the same thing. Mary had to understand that because this is what God wants, I can do this. It may not make sense, but it's what God wants. And then we saw that God wants to be your strength. There's a lot of things in our lives that come up and a lot of things that, that take a lot of time, take a lot of effort, take a lot of emotion. And many times we feel like, God, I just can't do this. And you're right. We can't do it. In fact, the Bible says, for without me, you can do nothing. He wants to be our strength. He wants us to lean on Him. Mary could have never done what she did. She couldn't have been the mother of the Savior without God's strength. Because this wasn't an easy task. I'm sure that in that day they had gossipers and they had naysayers and everybody was talking bad about them, I'm sure. but it was God's will. And God gave her and Joseph the strength to get through this task. And sometimes I think we forget that and sometimes we have a tendency to try to do things in our own strength and in our own efforts and then when we fail, we tend to blame God. When in reality, the truth is we didn't use Him as our strength. So many lessons that we learned from the life of Mary, but today... I saw this and and I thought I would continue it because as we look into the life of Mary, I want to show you today three lessons that she learned as she went through this and lessons that we can apply to our lives. And so I hope it will be a blessing to you. The first lesson that I want you to see is in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 42, we see here that Mary had to learn to accept his purpose. She had to learn to accept his purpose. In Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 42, the Bible says, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk, and acquaintances. 
And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So as we look at this passage, we, we, you know, all of us have probably read this or, or heard this uh, several times. And, and we're not going to spend a great deal of time on the fact that they lost the Son of God for four days. I mean, think about that. If there's not enough pressure to raise the Son of God, now he's lost. And it takes him four days to find him. I mean, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty tough stuff. You know, it, yeah, it's scary. But, but you think about that, when they finally find Jesus, what's he doing? He's sitting in the temple and he's among all of the teachers and, and all of the teachers that are in Jerusalem are looking at this child who's 12 years old and they're just amazed. They're, they're dumbfounded at his wisdom. They're dumbfounded at, at the questions that he's asking and his understanding of the Scriptures, and they just can't understand what's going on here. And Joseph and Mary find him, and of course, you know, uh, we see here that his parents are, are shocked and they're disappointed, and, and, and even Mary in her response, she says in verse, uh, verse 48, how did you bring this sorrow upon us? Why would you do this to us? And what did Jesus say? Wished ye not that I should be about my father's business? Now, while it says in verse 50 that they didn't understand his answer, we really get a different reaction from Mary. Look at verse 51. Verse 51 says, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. So even though the Bible says they didn't understand this, we need to understand that Mary knows who he is. Mary was told by Gabriel who this is going to be and told her of his purpose and told her what he was coming to do. So Mary understood the purpose of her son. That's why she's keeping these things in her heart. And we got very much the same response when the wise men came after his birth, you remember that, when he was two years old and the wise men come in and they're worshiping him and they're giving gifts. And what does the Bible say? She pondered all these things in her heart. She's watching this take place and she knows what the angel has told her. She knows who this child is supposed to be. She knows his purpose here. As a mother, she had to accept his purpose. Now think about that. Imagine being the mother of the Savior. Now, I don't believe she understood everything that that entailed. I don't believe she understood everything that was going to take place in his life. But she understood that this is the Son of God, and He's come to save mankind. Now, what that means, she doesn't know. Maybe that's why she's pondering these things in her heart. She's watching all of these people worship her Son. She sees his wisdom. She sees everything that's going on around his life, and she's probably wondering, what's going to happen next? Where's he going to go? What is he going to do? What is going to happen? But it took a mother's heart for her to accept that this is his purpose. But not, not only did the angel Gabriel tell her this and, and the wise men when they came to worship him, but in this passage we also see other people every time they came near they would worship her son. Back up, if you will, to verse 25. In verse 25 of Luke chapter 2, it says here, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem 
whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and a glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through his own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Can you just picture this in your mind? Now, they're coming to Jerusalem for this feast, but they're also coming to, to take care of the, the ceremonial services and everything that they have to do. So they walk into this temple with their, with their son, with their child, and Simeon sees them and grabs their son and begins praising God. And he says, now I can die in peace. I've seen the Messiah. Is that not what God promised him? He would not die until he saw the Messiah. He wouldn't die until he saw the Christ, which is what Messiah is. And, and so he, he comes to him and he, he lifts him up and he starts praising God. And how did Simeon know that this was the Messiah? Because the Bible says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit of God testified to Simeon, this is him. This is my son. This is the Savior. But did you catch what he told Mary? Can you imagine as he's holding this child, it says he is set for a fall and rising up again. The spear is going to pierce his side, pierce his soul. Can you imagine? Now what is she pondering in her heart? Everything that these people are telling her about her son because she knows who he is. And as a mother, she has to accept his purpose. Look at verse 36. Simeon wasn't the only one. In verse 36, the Bible says here, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So now here we see Anna comes in and she sees Jesus and, and she begins praising God and she begins to understand that this is the Messiah, this is the Savior, this is the one that we've been waiting for. And Mary's watching all of this take place. I, you know, I wouldn't even say as a mother, I would say as a parent. As a parent, how does it feel when people praise your child? You know, we look at that sometimes and we say, man, they see my, my child's effort, they see my child's uh, wisdom, they see my child's work, and they're, they're acknowledging them, they're, they're praising them because they did a great job, but as a parent, isn't there always a little bit inside of us that says, I did that? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I had a big part in that. You know, I got them to this, but right? I mean, and we want them to be praised and we want them to be honored, but as a parent, we know that they wouldn't be there without us. That's not the case here, is it? This is the Son of God, this is God in the flesh. And the mother side of Mary has to learn to let go and accept his purpose. Right. 
but and again, and I think that's the part they didn't understand. You know, when the Bible says they didn't understand, I think that was maybe Joseph is saying, but I'm a carpenter. You know, I'm not in the temple. But I think Mary, in her heart, she understood what he was saying. But maybe it wasn't time to be revealed yet. So at the same time, again, we still have that same mentality. She has to accept who and what her son is. Because regardless of him being the son of God, he's still her son. Is he not? I mean, he grew inside her womb. She gave birth to him. You know, she fed him. She took care of him. She's, she's still his mother. And she has to be willing to let go. Say, whatever his purpose is, I'm okay with that. So how do we apply that? Well, what's the purpose of God in our lives? Well, what, what purpose is Christ trying to do through you and me? Hey, as a parent, what's God's purpose for our children? We have to learn to let go and let our children seek the will of God sometimes, and we have to be willing to say, listen, you need to do what God wants you to do. I would love you to be this, or I would love you to work here, I would love you to do this or that, but what does God want you to do? And we have always tried to practice that. I mean, we've asked our kids over the years, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? And it always changes, doesn't it? And we always come back and we say, you need to pray about it and seek God's will. Because unless you're doing what God wants you to do, you're not going to be happy. But if you're in the center of God's will, I don't care what you do. Because it's His will for your life. That's where Mary's at. And that's where we have to be. Not only with ourselves and with our own lives, but that's where we have to be with our children. God, if, if this is your will for their lives, then I accept it. If this is your will for my life, I accept it. Mary had to learn to accept His will. Next, we also see in, in John chapter 2, if you'll turn there, John chapter 2, we see that she had to learn to acknowledge his power. Mary had to learn to acknowledge his power. Again, she knows who he is. In John chapter 2, again, we've read this story probably a million times. All right, John chapter 2 and verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. <laughs> Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set uh, there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and they knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So again, you know, we, we've all read this passage many times. We've probably heard it taught. And, and, and again, I think it's one of those things that we just kind of take for granted. You know, we, oh yeah, Jesus turned water into wine. You know, a big deal. Yeah, great. That was his first miracle. I don't believe that this is the first Miracle, I believe this is the first recorded miracle. I believe Mary has seen things. Mary has seen him grow. Mary has seen, I mean, he's at this point, he's 33 years old, right? So, so Mary has seen evidence in his life of probably miracles, but, but she had to learn to acknowledge his power. She had to say to these servants, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Now, let's understand something here. Jesus and the disciples were just guests at this wedding. 
They had no authority here. This would have been uncommon of the day for somebody to come along as a guest and start giving orders. I mean, you ever had people come to your house and start giving you orders? It doesn't work well, does it? I mean, in reality, as we look at this, Jesus is a nobody here. But now Mary says, he's the one that can fix this problem. He's the one that can take care of this. And she tells all of the servants, and for some reason they listen to her, she must have had some kind of clout or some kind of relationship with them. And, and, and she says, just do whatever he tells you to do. But when she comes to him and she says, they're out of wine, what did he say? Woman, what have I to do with thee? So we have a slight rebuke here, don't we? But I want you to notice he didn't call her mother. Because Jesus is now addressing her as her Lord. That's what we need to understand. She's acknowledging his power, and he is about to display his power. He's not acknowledging her as his son. That's why he calls her woman. This is a term of respect, but at the same time, it's not, Mom, come on, right? He's acknowledging that he is her Lord and her Savior. And she's about to experience the same miracle that everybody else is going to experience. And she's, I can kind of see her in the background saying, wait, wait, just wait and see what he does. This is going to be good. I've seen this before. You know, Because I, I guarantee you she's seen him do things before. This is not a surprise to her. But she had to acknowledge his power before all of them there. And Jesus is saying, you know, it's not really time for me to be revealing myself as the Messiah. And, and I think it was kind of a secret thing. You know, it's kind of between Jesus, the disciples, and the servants. The master of the feast had no idea what was going on, did he? Because it says when they brought the wine to the governor, he was like, wow, this is, this is good. Where did this come from? And all the servants are thinking, He's drinking water. Yeah. <laughs> but what an amazing miracle. And the Bible tells us here that it's at this point. Now the disciples had followed him. All right. The disciples are following him because they're with him. But it says here at this point, his disciples believed on him. Do you see the change here? They saw the power of Jesus because Mary acknowledged who he was and the disciples were in awe. And they believed on him. They were already following him. Maybe there was some doubt. Maybe there was some confusion. Maybe they, they didn't know what to think, but all of a sudden things have changed. And, and the reason that Mary knew that, that he could do this is because Mary understood he had the power to fix any problem. He's the Son of God. Mary knew who He was. No one else there knew yet who He was. You see, we look at this and, and we think, oh yeah, Jesus turned water into wine. That's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. That's pretty nice. And... But He's displaying His power. I mean, I, I don't understand science a whole lot, but... I know that to physically transform water into wine is not a very easy task. I mean, you think about that. Into good wine. And then, that quick, it's done. All he told them was fill the water pots and dispense the wine. And it was done. But here's the problem. We, as Christians, sometimes forget that he has this power. I'm not saying he has, you know, oh, I've got a glass of water. Come on, Jesus, give me some wine. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying he has all power. And it doesn't matter what your situation is. It doesn't matter what your problem is. He has the power to fix it. And until we acknowledge his power in our lives, then we are not going to see these miracles happen for us. And that's what we've got to understand. We have to learn the same lesson that Mary learned here. 
We have to learn to acknowledge Jesus Christ's power in our lives and His willingness to show that power. Because Mary knew, if I ask Him, He'll take care of it. Again, she got a slight rebuke there, didn't she? But He took care of the problem. Sometimes we, and I think, maybe it's just me, but I think sometimes we look at our problems on a daily basis and we look at them one of two ways. It's either too little to take to God because God doesn't care about the little things. Or it's too big and I have to figure it out. You know, we're somewhere in the middle. We don't mind asking God to answer prayers, right? But when it's a big problem or a little problem, we, for some reason, don't want to take those to God. And I don't understand that. Because He has power to fix every problem. He has the power to take care of every single need that we have, no matter how minuscule or how great we think it is. He can do anything. Again, I I used to tell uh, my, my preacher boys when I would teach them, you know, when you get up in the morning, pray about what God wants you to wear. Why? Because the Bible says we're to pray without ceasing. We're to pray in everything. So every need, every trial, every difficulty, every aspect of life I should bring before God in prayer and I should just acknowledge that He has power to do whatever I need and I'm going to trust Him in my life. That's what Mary had to learn here. I believe she learned it at a young age as raising Him, but it was here that it was shown at the wedding of Canaan. Yeah. That other people said this is just one more point. Um, I got a heart. What did she do? What did that do? Yeah. That's on her behalf. Just constantly God was there. Yeah. He was tied to this man, written on him every week. But we shouldn't have to go through needing a heart transplant to see God's power. Oh no. I mean, I'm I'm thankful that you experienced that, but that will help you, right? To know that God did that for me. I I can take any problem before Him. And that's what we need to understand. You know, yeah, man, you need a heart. We need to pray, right? And we we need to ask God to take care of this need, and we need to ask God to provide. And when He does, we shouldn't step back and say, Oh, okay, that one's done. Thanks, God. Right? We should acknowledge His power and say, God, you are, you are amazing. Look what you did. And carry that through every aspect of our life. And I believe that's what Mary learned here. She said, I can bring this wine situation before Him because I know what He can do. This is nothing. His power is awesome, right? The last lesson I want you to see here today, this is, again, what Mary learned in John chapter 19. I think this is probably one of the toughest lessons that Mary had to learn. Mary had to learn to adapt to his path. In John chapter 19, Look, if you will, at verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. 
Mary had to ad adapt to his path. Notice here, again, Jesus addresses her as woman. He's not addressing her as mother. So again, he's addressing her as her Lord, as her Savior. He's saying, we have a different relationship now. John is now your son. John, this is now your mother. And we also need to understand that at this point, there's, there's no sign of Joseph, there's no mention of Joseph. So there's reason to believe that at this point Mary is a widow, and, and she's probably in her mid-50s at this time. And, and in this situation, in this day and age, this is a very difficult situation for Mary to be in. A widow in her 50s, and, 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 and her son is a vagabond preacher, and he's the one that's supposed to be taking care of her because he's the oldest in the family, and now he's about to die. And he says, John, this is now your mother. What's he saying? You're responsible for Mary. Take care of her as you would take care of your own mother. And so we see that, and, 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 and we often wonder, how difficult would that have been for Mary? It's not enough that she's, she's watched her son be beaten the way they beat him. I mean, the Bible describes his crucifixion as if you, could not, you couldn't even tell it was a man. You know, we've seen all the cute little pictures of a little blood drop on his wrist and some blood on his head. You could not even tell... They said, the Bible says his visage was so marred, you couldn't tell it was human. They destroyed his body, and she watched this happen. They nailed him to that cross, and she's watching him breathe his last breaths. And in one of his last breaths, what does he say? Woman, I'm no longer your son. I'm your Savior. He's your son. And she had to adapt her life. She had to change everything to fit his path. Now, the path of the cross, for sure, but also his path in her life. Things were about to change. Every aspect of her life was going to be different. Everything was going to be uh, uh, up, uprooted and, and, and just completely different than she had been used to before. Sure, she knew John, I, 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 and I'm sure that she had a relationship with John. As, as one of the, the disciples of Jesus, she would have been there during the ministry and got to know him, but she's now his mother, according to Jesus, right? So she has to adapt to that as well. I want you to turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, we see here now... now we need to also remember, when we get to the book of Acts, Jesus has been crucified. He's risen from the grave. He has now addressed His disciples. He's addressed His followers. He's addressed His mother. He's addressed all of those people that have watched His ministry. And now they watch Him ascend into heaven. And we pick it up in verse 12. Verse 12 says, Then return they unto Jerusalem, from the Mount of Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotus and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Everybody see that? So again, this is several days after even the resurrection. Because we know that Jesus went about and he ministered after, after the resurrection. He, many people saw him. He went about Jerusalem and he went about doing more works that we don't have recorded in Scripture. But now this is after his ascension and all of the disciples get together to pray and the Bible says here that Mary is with them. Why? Because John is there. She adapted to his path. This was now his will 
for her life. The will of my Savior is for me to be John's mother. And where John goes, I go. Just as she followed Jesus and followed his ministry, now she's following John. You see this? So we have evidence in Scripture that Mary adapted. She changed her life. She uprooted everything because this was the will of God. And many times we look at this and we look at our lives and we say, but God, I can't do that. God, I can't go there. God, I can't talk to those people. God, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. Right? But He can. And when we learn to adapt to His path and we learn to accept His will, we can do anything because it's done through Him. And you may have heard me say this a million times before, but when God called me to preach, I felt like Moses did. God, you've made your first mistake. I can't do that. I can't teach your word. I had never even read through the Bible yet. I didn't understand the Bible. I still don't understand the Bible. Who does? But, God, you want me? No, that's not going to work. But I had to adapt. I had to change. And as I would adapt, the Word of God would change me and create in me what He wanted, and then His path was possible because He was the one doing the work and not me. Because I was right. I can't do it, but he can. So Mary had to adapt to this path. And, and here again in Acts chapter 1, we have evidence that she did, but do we just take that on face value? There's a church that has been built in Jerusalem near uh, the, the Mount of Olives. And this church is dedicated, they, they claim it's the burial place of Mary, and it's dedicated to the worship of Mary. Now, obviously Catholic, you know, and, and that's fine, but, you know, we can see that in history because they believe that this chapel or this little church is the burial place of Mary, so they obviously go there. So it, it tells us that she possibly would have remained in Jerusalem. But, Tradition tells us that John had a home in Ephesus. In Ephesus, there is also a church that has been erected as to be the place where Mary died. And so followers will go there to worship Mary in the home and the church near the home where she died. And it's possible she was carried back to Jerusalem and buried, but it's also possible she was buried in Ephesus. But the truth of the matter is, John was in Ephesus. And this church to Mary is built in Ephesus. And we have tradition and historical fact that shows us that John was there and Mary was with him. So she, was, she learned to adapt to his path. Say. This is what he has for my life. I will continue to do his will until the day I die. And we need to learn the same lesson. It doesn't matter what God asks us to do. It doesn't matter where he tells us to go. Can you imagine uh, being Margaret was it Springer or Stringer? Margaret Stringer when, when God sent her to Papua New Guinea? And, you know, they dropped her off in a helicopter. They couldn't even land because of the cannibals that were there. And she tells the story wonderfully. I wish they would have her here again. She tells the story of being dropped off in this helicopter, helicopter and being surrounded by naked men. And she had no idea what to do. Can you imagine her thinking, this is the will of God for my life? Scared to death? And hundreds of thousands of Papua New Guinea tribes people came to know Christ through her ministry because she adapted to his path. And that's what you and I need to do. God, it may sound crazy, it may not make sense, but whatever you want for my life, that's what I will do.
with your help because I can't do it by myself. Mary had to learn these lessons just like we have to learn. She had to learn to accept his purpose. This is my son, but I've got to let him go. I don't understand this, but I've got to do it because this is the purpose. What's the purpose for illness? What's the purpose for, for, for financial troubles? What's the purpose? We've got to seek God. God, whatever the purpose is, I accept it. Teach me, guide me, lead me. We need to acknowledge his power. God, you can do anything that I need done. And I'm going to lean on you and trust you to do it. And we need to adapt to his path. Wherever you lead me, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Because your will is always what is best. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for these lessons, and thank you again for what we can see in the life of Mary. And just pray, Lord, that you would help us all to take these lessons to heart and apply them to our lives each and every day. Lord, we pray you'd be with the services to follow this morning. Uh, be with Brother Woodard as he brings the message. and Fill him with your power and your boldness as he preaches. Be with our pastor as he's preaching this morning as well. Give him power and, and work in his heart through your word. We love you and we thank you in Christ's precious name. Amen.